So I'm really, really delighted and honored uh, to be here uh, this afternoon, evening, uh, whatever time it is. Uh, and I would like to start off by making four comments around this whole notion of uh, disability and inclusion. And I hope that that will form the basis of a further conversation uh, with the group, with the system panel and the group. The first point I want to make is that when people think of disability, usually they think of it at extremes. So somebody who's had an extreme disability. I would submit that it's not about the extremes, but it's a continuum, right? So, you know, magically at age 40, you start wearing glasses, right? Uh, going to a restaurant right now, which is very, very dimly lit, makes it painful to kind of read the menu, right? Not to talk about going to a hotel shower room and trying to figure out what is shampoo and conditioner, uh, you know. So these are all things which affect normal people, right? And some of it may be sight, some may be taste, some may be sound, uh, and so many other things. So when we think about disability, I would submit, don't think of it at the extremes, think of it as a continuum. If that is the case, then it is really, really, really critical to understand that all of us are living, or a lot of us are living with some sense of loss uh, of our capabilities, right? And if my customer base is going through that, then it's really important that my employee base be reflective of my customer base. Because only if the employee base is reflective of the customer base, Will my colleagues and I be able to truly understand the customer? And it's only if I truly understand the customer will I be able to build products and services which are designed for that kind of customer base, right? So, for example, one of the best things about the iPad or the iPhone, for example, is pinch. Just by pinching, you can make the format larger, and therefore, for all of us who can't read the very, very small fine print, it works beautifully, right? So that's point number two. So point number one, don't think of it in extremes, think of it as a continuum. Point number two, employee base must be reflective of customer base, and therefore, how do we kind of think about that? Point number three, in designing products and services, first think about this right from word go. You can't think about disability and inclusion at the end. You've got to design for it right at word go, right? And in designing for word go, I would say test at the extremes. Because if you test at the extremes, you will get a good product. Let me give you a classic example. A lot of you, would, if you, if I open your wallet, will have a debit card inside your wallet, a bank card or a credit card and stuff like that. A lot of you will see that over a period of time, it becomes really difficult to read the letters uh, and the numbers on the on the credit card or on the debit card. And you wonder why that, you know, the silver kind of fades off, the background colors are very, very strong. And so a young person in one of our branches, very young person in one of our branches, you know, which is in an area which, they are, you know, lots of elderly kind of people, realized this is a problem and came and said, hey, Ashok, why the hell is it that we always design our, credit cards and our debit cards with dark navy blue, why can't we do it with colors that help people which have, who have visual, visual problems? So we thought about it and we said, that's a great idea. And so we went with green and with orange. And so we said, people who've got visual difficulties, hey, you know what? We've got a card designed specifically for you that can help you uh, read the letters, know where to insert the card, know how to use the card, etc. Right? And then it struck us as to if we can put any color on the card, why can't we just allow the customer to choose whatever photograph they want on their card? Be it their kids, be it their dog, be it their yacht, be it their home, so whatever. Right? Now, to think about it and you say, and I open the wallet, guess which card I like to see the most? I obviously like to see the card the most, which has got my dog or my yacht or, you know, uh, my girlfriend, because that's what, you know, builds an emotional connection with the product. So if you start with testing at the extreme, that is somebody with severe visual difficulty, right? 
and how can you cater to a product for them and you land up in a place which is in a completely different place which leads to a much 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 higher level of engagement right it's a win 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 from a inclusivity perspective a win 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 from allowing uh, allowing the customer to really engage with the product in a different way finally my fourth point is look a lot of people will tell you oh this is going to require a lot of expenses you know it's very complicated and i would say no i would say the very very simple things you can start with uh, which can help about 3 4 months earlier my wife went into a showroom uh, you know to get some watch straps as she was walking out of the store room a whole bunch of steps she missed a step fell and hurt her right shoulder very very badly right so much so that we were worried that she would have to go into surgery now at the time when there's covid raging you really don't want to be spending time in hospitals so you can imagine how painful that was right had that store just put a little yellow line even a yellow tape at the end of the step they would have avoided such a case we later on figured out that it was a common happening that people were missing the step and taking a tumble how hard and how expensive is it just to put a little yellow tape on that stair to signify to a customer that the stair is kind of over so don't think of this as something which is very expensive very painful to do there are lots of small things that we can do to really get ahead so like i said four points number 1 don't i would submit uh, disabilities are on a continuum and not at the extremes number 2 the employee base must be reflective of your customer base if your customer base is going through those difficulties get your colleague base to look at that and they will only understand the products and services if they are reflective of the customer base number 3 test at the extremes if you test at the extremes the product you develop is usually the best number 4 there are lots of simple solutions out there you don't need to build a rolls royce or spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to kind of cater to this i'll stop there and uh open it up for a discussion well i think ashok so i hear myself echoing i hope i'm not echoing to the world um thank you that's very interesting i love the way you do 444 just there <laughs> i wanted to focus in particular if i may on your point about how if your employees reflect your customers <laughs> everybody wins <clears throat> and i was reminded of some work that bnq did where they found that removing obstacles for disabled customers made it easier on the recruitment front can you give some examples of how removing exa- removing obstacles for customers whether it's online or face to face has actually made it easier on recruitment so so there's so many uh, examples of let's take it let's take one of them right as you all know mobile banking has taken off big time right now what happens if somebody is uh, visually impaired what if we could get the mobile phone to actually speak out what the customer is looking to get right so i want my balances and the mobile phone talks to me right great great efficiency tool for the customer avoids a call much more profitable far lower expense get a much greater customer satisfaction right ditto you know talking atms right so this you know so many such things uh, which are frankly not very complicated uh, which can have a massive impact when you look at what you were saying about how you've learned over the years because barclays has been investing in in this territory since you helped me to set up the first business network back in the early 90s um for many companies as you say they're assuming it's expensive it's too hard etc so what would your advice be to a chief executive perhaps someone who's just signed up to the valuable 500 where should they start when leaders are looking at trying to both be a better employer of disabled people and of course at the customer service front of things where would so, you Susan, to start yeah so i'd say two things right the first thing i'd say is i've become a very 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 firm believer very firm right 
that every organization, every company must have a social purpose, right? You take your social purpose, whatever that may be, housing, education, whatever that may be. You know, a lot of people tell me, uh, so what about companies like Apple? Apple made the use of technology intuitive. Even today, any Apple product does not come with a training manual, right? Why? Their social purpose is to make technology intuitive, right? So whatever, and look, Apple, nobody can accuse Apple of uh, doing a lot of uh, CSR or not being profitable, right? So this notion that adhering to a social purpose actually is CSR or doesn't lead to profitability is fundamentally flawed, right? Number two is it's all about mindset, right? If we are sitting in a country where, you know, 13 million people in the UK out of 63 million people have got vaccinations. They've invited everybody who's over 70 and anybody who's got, you know, uh, frontline workers. There are at least 10 million people in this country, round numbers, who are over 70 years of age. What are we doing for them to make our products and services truly relevant for them? There is a business reason to do this. And if the chief executives can get their mindset around that, I think it will change the way companies go about thinking about this. And what would be the first thing you would suggest they actually do to help them to get that mindset change? Speak to the front line. Aha, that's the right message. That's what I'm after. Talk to your front line. Talk to your own people. Talk to your customers. Is that right? That is absolutely right, Judith. Well, I can see Professor Stein on screen now. Does that mean we've run out of times? Please, conti right. please continue. Continue, all right. Because I had one more question. As you know, many of our, our viewers, our audience today, are actively working in the disability sector, if we can call it that. So they're disabled people's organizations or their charities working on behalf of people with disabilities. We've got public policy makers. And, and sometimes I think they struggle to understand that the needs of business and the aspirations of disabled people can over, you know, come together, but this is where they overlap. What advice would you have to organizations trying to persuade the private sector to change the mindset in the way that you've described, Ashok? What would you do if you were running a big disability organization in, in America or Kenya or India? What, what would you do? I would first say hire Susan, Susan, because she'll do the best job that there is to do. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Susan, uh, I think we've all learned that what we really got to do is stop thinking about disability at its extremes, right? We've got to start thinking disability as a uh, on a continuum, right? And if you start thinking disability on a continuum, the whole mindset and thinking changes, right? Uh, and if, if if you think about it that way, you take a completely different view to this. You don't take it as something which is, uh, you know, a CSR kind of activity. You say much larger sections of my customer base are actually affected by this. And much larger sections of the customer base are affected by this, the business model becomes much, much, much easier to kind of develop, right? And I think it's so much easier uh, to kind of, uh, focus on the emotional aspects at the extreme, right? And, you know, there, there, is, there is some place for that, but I think thinking about it uh, more broadly would be definitely more effective. Well, I think, though, you've picked up on something important because many of the organizations that try to get people with disabilities into jobs that focus on employment do nothing to help the employer respond to their customers. And actually, what you're saying is there's a missing trick here, yes? That if you help the private sector to understand how to meet the needs of their customers, they will start to remove obstacles and start to get the mindset change that you're talking about, which helps unemployment. We've got to bring them yeah. together, don't we? Exactly, Susan. It's like it's like a you know, like a virtuous circle, right? Because if you say that, you know, it's not on the it's it is a continuum, you have enough people who try and understand this, you get the good benefits, you play up the good stories. Once you play up the good stories, success means success, right? And it just flows through. And Susan, 
competition it amongst the work uh, you know you did your forum all the companies that came up, came together in that forum sharing their kind of stories it was it was so enriching right uh, to see uh, how much good can be done and at the same time how much good it is for business and why there's a business imperative to do this kind of stuff well, i do think internationally of course we're seeing more and more business disability networks emerging at the national level particularly those of course associated with the ILO's global business network helping companies come together in these learning exchanges you're describing in Kenya and so on so there's a real opportunity also for public policy makers and advocates to support those business networks because they can play a crucial role in that mindset change that you were you were referencing excellent i would agree with that Susan. and so um like they say on television i'm going to keep going until i'm stopped because i'm not i've lost track of the timing here i'm seeing images go through i have one more question actually which was as you look at how you um inspire people in the business to actually come with you on this i know you've got a program is it called this is me where your colleagues actually record little videos of themselves talking about their experience as employees um what what is your experience why did you launch that program i mean to do with culture change and so on but can you talk a bit about the impact that it's had to be able to hear someone say well i'm in marketing at barclays and you know i have a disability but this is my reality what what's your view of all that because i know a number of companies have taken up that model yeah uh, so susan uh, look there are two things to this right the first thing to this is what we talked about you know success breeds success right so if you can talk about stuff and say you know here here's what happened here's what i did here's what you know the outcome was uh you become like a role model and you are helping uh, change the mindset of somebody else hopefully a group of other people and the collective group of other people collective mindset shift of a group of people leads to a different kind of culture right and this is about mindset and culture right that you know we are this is frankly all about customer obsession this is being obsessed about your customer and trying to get it right uh, uh getting it getting it right for the customer and uh, the other thing which you know um, uh which has become evident to me susan is look i've been uh, you know i've been in a good position uh in the bank for the last 4 5 6 years right and you ask me at all of what was your profit in 199 in 2014 2015 2016 2017 2017 right till last year honestly i don't remember honestly it's not even relevant do really people care that you know we made 3 billion 465 million 371642 pounds nobody gives a damn but what stories if i helped a person today in the branch and it made a significant impact to that person when i come home and i talk to my spouse and my kids right that sense of pride comes through and having an having an environment having an organization that allows you to do that right makes you feel good everybody wants to do the right thing 99.9% of the people in this world want to do the right thing in the environment they are allowed to do the right thing they feel that this is an organization they belong to they feel that this is a organization with a heart and if that what they're doing is a heart delivers good business results that's how you get discretionary effort so you get employee inclusion you get employee loyalty you get discretionary effort and better results now tell me what is wrong with that story Well then why is it so hard to persuade some of your counterparts? <laughs> Come on. Susan, yeah, honestly it's all about getting the mindset right. Right? If we get the mindset around these things right, I think everything else kind of falls into place. But that's what we said, but I said how do we get that mindset? And I think actually it links to what you've been saying all along. It's trying to get that personal conversation between the business leader, their customer, their colleagues with disabilities. 
And of course, with advocates and change agents out there, like the Caroline Casey's of this world. Yeah. I mean, kind of stuff that you did uh, and are doing with the with the disability forum. I think Susan had massive impact, right? Uh, and the way you were able to bring in uh, lots of senior leaders uh, uh, also had a had a massive impact. And then the more we can encourage that kind of thing. Uh, you know, in different regions, uh, uh, in Africa, in Asia, the United States, uh, you know, uh, I think we need to pay a lot more attention to this in the U.S. as well. Uh, you know, and creation of these kind of forums to do that, I think, is very, very important. Just one final thought, then. You know, as you look around the world, you often hear that the business community saying, well, we can't make progress on this in this region because of the culture. There's a cultural difference in terms of their approach to disability, and this culture is different. And so we simply sort of ad hoc leave it to national leaders to respond in their own cultures. We can't get consistent fair treatment for disabled people worldwide. What is your response to that, Mr. Vaswani? Is that true? Susan, uh, I have been uh, very, very, very blessed I was born and brought up in Bombay. I spent a lot of uh, my initial working years in Dubai. From there, I got transferred to Istanbul. I spent a year in Brussels. I spent three years in New York. I then went to Singapore for three years. I came back to New York for three years. And for the last 10 years, I've been in London. While I was in London, I spent about two years uh, while I was living in, well, my wife was living in London. I was on a plane to Africa. So I always say, first of all, thank God there are no bank branches in Siberia. <laughs> Otherwise, they would, have sent me, uh, they would have sent me there as well. But look, there are very, very few parts of the world that I have not worked in. And I've been very blessed by that. right? And I have come to the sincere, sincere belief right, that people's hopes and aspirations are frankly no different. At the heart of it, at the heart of it, everyone wants to just get a little ahead. Once their kids getting a little more ahead than they did, right? And they want to do it in the right way and they want to kind of move ahead. Now, moving ahead may mean very different things to you and to me and to, to Professor Stein. But in their own way, you have moving ahead. So for people to tell me that there's a cultural difference around disability, sorry, Susan, I just don't buy that. I just do not. I think there are excuses, and there are multiple excuses. The cultural difference, our population is too young. By the way, this is too expensive. By the way, who cares? You know, you know. honestly, that's. I don't have time for that kind of stuff. Well, one of my favorites is a very senior guy from a German bank said, but we don't even do women. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Su Susan, Mr. Vaswani, I'm, I'm afraid I have to come in here now. Uh, it's always, uh, I'm always have to be the bad guy in this, uh, in this moderator role. And uh, actually, I could uh, continue listening into your, to your conversation of, of such uh, committed and, and engaged people like the both of you. Uh, but unfortunately, I have to, to, to cut in here and uh, thank you both for uh, this discussion. I think it was really worthwhile and, 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 and gave us a lot of, of inspirational thoughts and, and, and ideas that can take us definitely uh, to next steps. Um, so my role is now, and I'm really glad and honored to have that role uh, to announce our next keynote speaker, which is uh, Professor Michael Ashley Stein. Uh, Professor Stein is the co-founder and executive director of the Harvard Law Business School. Uh, he was uh, awarded no, uh, enormous numbers of times for uh, different awards uh, ex for his exceptional work. Uh, and he's definitely considered one of the leading experts uh, worldwide on disability law and uh, policy. Uh, Michael, are you here with us? Can you hear me? I hear you well, Michael. Yeah, so welcome, Michael. And uh, uh, the, the floor is yours for your keynote. And after your keynote, we will bring in uh, Professor Lazar for a, a conversation. Thank you ever so much for having me. Um, I've been fortunate enough to try and support my friends at Zero since their inception, and I'm always teaching at this time of year, and, and am this year as well. But thanks to Zoom and, and uh, as a very tiny benefit of, of the horrible 
circumstances we're all undergoing, I've been able to join you virtually, and, and I'm very pleased to do so, and I'm glad to be here. Um, today, we're going to talk about disability, employment, and information and communication technology, ICT. And I see them as being two systemic problems with two systemic great potentials, um, employment and, and ICT. I'm thinking maybe the advances in ICT can help leverage employment, and perhaps we see the potential for moving forward. But frankly, and those of you who know me know that I always say what I think is right rather than what I think you would like to hear. I also have lots of concerns, um, and I also have lots of frustrations when it comes to disability and employment, a subject that I've been studying for well over 30 years. I honestly believe that we are at a tipping point. I think we are at a point where either we are going to see developing synergy between the use of ICT and increased employment for people with disabilities and therefore progress, or that we will see the disability sector falling even further behind. And again, to be bluntly honest, I'm not sure which one it is. I'd like to be positive and I'd like to try to emphasize those. And so I won't go on and on about all the problems in greater detail than is already known to the audience. Um, but I'd like to highlight some things because I'm frustrated by it. And not only have I studied it for 30 years, I have worked in the sector for many years and was on the board of a very large multinational uh, NGO that worked on this for over a dozen years. In employment, looking around the world, we see lower numbers for the disability employment rate than everywhere. And in parentheses, yes, we are always suspicious about numbers because of lack of self-disclosure, but nonetheless, the numbers are fairly consistent. People with disabilities, when they are employed, are generally not employed so much in the formal labor market, what's called the open labor market, although it's not really open. But instead, we see a disproportionately large number of people with disabilities in informal employment, which includes part-time work, piecemeal work, microfinance stimulated work, social enterprises, and even sheltered workshops, which as we know, have a very deep and dark history. The origin for all this is, you know, lies in the idea that disabled equals not able. And that's a notion that crosses cultures and history. Um, sadly, it seems to be rather uniform, even if the flavors are expressed differently. The Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the CRPD, which I had the privilege to be able to participate in its negotiations, provides reasonable accommodations and employment and also includes the denial of reasonable accommodations as part of discrimination. It's in the non-discrimination provision. Country-wise, if we were to look around the world at you know, 182 UN member states have ratified the CRPD, we would see that roughly in 70% of high-income countries and 40%-ish of middle and low-income countries, there are laws that guarantee reasonable accommodations. The idea that employers have to adjust the way that the work is being conducted, the idea that employers need to provide reasonably costed assistive technology and other devices that enable people with disabilities to perform essential job functions. So the law is, is there, more or less. It could be better, but it's, it's there in many places. And yet the prejudice remains. Policies, and this is with due respect to zero winners, present and past and future, um, and to those that I saw as part of this large INGO, are almost all small projects. They tend to be pilot projects. They tend to focus on particular types of disabilities, such as those on the spectrum conducting accounting and other tasks, those with ID conducting manual labor, and they have a glass ceiling and they have a stainless steel door as far as making it into the other parts of a corporation or a business. It does very little to change the large culture of work. It does very little by way of positive culture change when diversity initiatives do not include the D word for disability. And I've seen that over and over again. We're going to include everyone, which is a great idea. Oh, except for disability because that's different. And there's also not enough of celebration of good practices, good things that do work and sharing of good practices. And frankly, there is not enough by way of disability pride and acceptance. 
Many corporations actually do try to get their employees with disabilities to self-disclose, even in anonymous formats, so that they can monitor their numbers. And many people with disabilities, because of fear of being outed, because of fear of stigma, um, will not disclose. And again, it's a highly, highly personal choice. But as far as the sector, looking at it from a bird's eye view, um, it doesn't push the ball forward. And so despite assurances by states under the CRPD, by CEOs under any number of, of schemes, whether it's called corporate social responsibility, whether it's called diversity, um, and by others, the numbers have not changed, at least for the 30-something years that I've viewed it, they haven't. And although there are some good initiatives like the Valuable 500, we still don't see the numbers pushing forward. What we see if we were to describe it is that the middle, the middle of the disability employment class is non-existent or too small. We see a large bulk in terms of the low wage, low skill entry level jobs. We see the super high achievers, what are known in disability studies as the super crips, the ones who have struggled and fought and made it to the top. But we don't see the basic individual. We don't see the middle class. We don't see the basic worker. And most humans, most people are in the middle. That's where we don't see it. The people who become middle management, the people who are there as a backbone of their companies. And frankly, the numbers are looking worse in times of economic crisis. Following the 2008 global recession, we saw a dip in the numbers. Following COVID, we're seeing a dip in the numbers. And this has to do in part with the economics. It also has to do in part with commitments or lack of commitments by states and corporations. The OECD countries, both in 2008 and now, dramatically reduced social welfare protections in times of, of global economic trouble. Um, and people with disabilities are part of that group. In ICT, we see a lower usage, lower access, lower accessibility everywhere, and especially a div digital divide that is deeper in the global south than it is in the global north. The Global South, on the other hand, is especially notable not only for internet access lagging, but also it's way ahead as far as mobile phone use. And so there is a potential there to think about how to use the mobile as a lower tech technology as far as trying to stimulate disability and employment. There is also, we should note, a gender gap with women having far less access than men. And yet technology that's inclusive and accessible can indeed be a game changer in how persons with disabilities in developing countries across all markets, spaces and services can access employment and participate to a greater extent in their communities. UNICEF's digital accessible textbook system is a great example of how we can increase education so that in turn we increase employment. Benetech's Bookshare, which frankly should get the Genius Award, um, has been doing marvelous work in sharing books and information across the world, and this accesses education. And of course, there are country-level initiatives in Kenya, Morocco, and elsewhere that are supporting accessible education through the use of ICT. And as people are more educated and also more adept at using ICT, their prospects improve for employment. Not a surprise, but something that needs to be emphasized. ICT itself as an industry represents a growing employment sector for persons with disabilities. Online or micro work sites such as Amazon Mechanical Turk or Upwork offer a digital space for freelancers to find clients and to deliver ICT based inputs. These sites offer flexibility for workers with disabilities and anonymity as far as their disabled identities. This is of course if very complex and often personal issue to disclose or not to disclose. But it is fair to note that for some people with disabilities who would otherwise experience prejudice due to in-person or visual interactions, interacting online can provide a buffer to some of those disabilities. Again, it's a highly personal choice, but if it comes across as a practice that enables more power to it. Business process outsourcing centers, what we would commonly include to call call centers, have been used as a model for ICT-based employment 
for persons with disabilities across the world, and especially so in developing countries. Social enterprises such as the Digital Divide Data Train, persons with disabilities and other groups marginalized from the labor market to perform digital work for jobs in the outsourcing industry. Anglesizecarrier.com, which is in Turkey and is a job matching and job seeking platform for persons with disabilities, to give an example, has been used by more than 10,000 people with disabilities in their employment search. Leonard Cheshire's Job Ability Online Jobs Portal has been serving job seekers with disabilities in places like India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Pakistan, the Philippines, and South Africa. Annie Galate in Brazil ran a marvelous online job fair this past September for over 100,000 job seekers with disabilities. I was very honored to be able to support them in a little way with a video speech. But here are some big unknowns. Here are things we need to think about. So I'd like to throw this out to you and provoke your thinking about it. One big unknown is how effective the World Bank's 10 commitments, the ones they made two years ago in London, and they're marvelous, fantastic commitments, are going to be as far as impacting the employment realm. How much will the World Bank's work on making disability and development inclusive trickle down to states, trickle down to employment? We don't know. There is great potential there, but we don't know. An equally big unknown is whether the evolving Business and Human Rights Treaty, which would come from the UN, will actually and overtly include disability. Right now, to give you background, the Millennium Compact, the one that was running in the UN, never included disability. And this forthcoming treaty, which is again percolating up, only implicitly includes disability by mentioning the CRPD in its preamble and grouping disability along with other vulnerable populations. This is for a group that comprises at least 15% of the global population. But the power and the ability of multinational corporations those companies that span companies, span regions, to affect change is absolutely unparalleled and has unlimited potential for effectuating change. That means employment, yes, but it also means accessibility for customers, means blockchain supplies, the things that they buy, the things that they sell, and it includes vendor practices. Imagine if the largest companies said, will no longer use software that is inaccessible to people with disabilities, will no longer rent offices that employees and customers with disabilities can't visit. And as far as our advertising and our outward facing view, we're going to be supportive of disability and be disability enablers. Enormous potential, enormous potential. And even bigger is the question, and again, at a tipping point where frankly, I don't know which way we're going, is what is artificial intelligence going to do regarding disability and employment? As you may or may not know, artificial intelligence at the present does not do a very good job of including the views, priorities, and needs of people with disabilities. And that includes large data sets that relate to healthcare, and it includes employment, where you know, often they will use screening devices to exclude people with disabilities. We also know that looking forward in 20 years, by 2040, there are expected to be 800 million jobs around the world lost to AI, lost to these machines. And there are expected to be at least a billion more people on the planet. What is that going to do regarding employees and potential employees with disabilities? We don't know the answers to these questions. I threw three of them out for you because I honestly feel that we are at a tipping point. We are at a point where we need to be very focused, very active, very angry, um, and, and very vocal about disability and employment, because if we don't get disability included in the AI agenda, if we don't get it included into the business and human rights treaty, if we don't get it included into the diversity agenda, people with disabilities will be left even farther behind. So great prospects, but also great concerns. I look forward to engaging with you on questions and answers, along with my friend, Professor Lazar and Michael. Thank you again for having me. Uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Professor Stein, for your um, thought-provoking ideas, as always, and uh, also for 
uh, defining the, uh, the tipping point. I think it will be a major food of thought for many of us. And uh, uh, yeah, so I think, as always, thank you for coming in and, and enriching uh, this, uh, this uh, conference so much. Um, yeah, at this stage, I would like to bring in uh, Professor Jonathan Lazar. Professor Jonathan Lazar is professor at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland in the United States. He has authored and edited 12 books uh, on um, um, human mind, um, machine concepts, concept and interactions on digital accessibility and has published over 140 uh, research papers. So welcome, uh, Professor Lazar. Hi, hello everyone. Good to be with you today. Welcome. Uh, Professor Lazar, we both watched now the, uh, the speech of, of, of Professor Michael Stein, and I would like you now to come in uh, and give your intervention in this uh, broad area of employment and ICT, and I see that you're focusing more on the, on the ICT side of, uh, of the topic, but please, stage is yours. Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure to be uh, here with all of you, and especially with my colleague, uh, Professor Michael Stein from Harvard Law School. Uh, so my, my thought is that you know, I hear different things depending on who I'm talking with about, we should be proud of all of these great accomplishments related to accessible technology, right? We should be proud that, you know, our mobile phones include a lot of accessibility features. We should be proud that our office applications are now starting to include some basic, uh, some basic accessibility features, some automation, some AI approaches. I hear some colleagues say, we should be proud of all we've accomplished. And then I hear other colleagues say, actually, things have not gone very well. Uh, and so if you look at, for instance, the number of companies you've talked about that still procure inaccessible technology, right? That still uh, provide, uh, you know, websites that are inaccessible. So both for the public and consumers, as well as for uh, employees, right? Inaccessible technologies. And I think both are true. There's a lot to celebrate that we've accomplished over the years, but yet there's so many challenges that lie ahead as Professor Stein was, uh, was discussing. And so the question is, how do we kind of deal with both at the same time? Because we don't just wanna say everything is bad. At the same time, there are so many things that are problematic. Um, I, I give the example in the United States of Domino's Pizza. And so Domino's Pizza is continuing to fight a lawsuit because they do not want to uh, make either their website or their mobile app accessible, right? And my question is always, doesn't Domino's Pizza want blind people to buy their pizza, right? To actually fix it, to actually make the website and the mobile app accessible would be very low cost. Instead, they're spending tons of money trying to fight the lawsuit and say, under no circumstances do we actually want to you know, have this legal right exist that people with disabilities should have the right to, to use our mobile app or our website. So how do we deal with those sort of ingrained biases, that ableism? This isn't a company saying, oh, well, you know, we, we didn't realize we were inaccessible, we're gonna fix it. This is a company saying, we realize and we're gonna keep fighting it because we don't wanna have to make our mobile app accessible or our website accessible. How do we deal with that? How do we deal with those ingrained biases, that systemic ableism? And so I think that when it comes to employment, you see many of those same situations be present, right? Where in some cases you have companies who certainly are willing to make changes once they're aware, and then you have some companies who don't. So there are so many points to kind of hit home about accessibility being innovation and how do we keep reminding people that, uh, as some of the examples were mentioned earlier today, that when you build with people with disabilities, right, it makes for a better product. It's innovative. It makes products that people enjoy more. So, you know, my, uh, my, my colleague, Professor Stein, had talked about kind of, it could go either way. I actually think it's going both ways. I think that we need to celebrate what we've accomplished but also focus on the systemic problems that we have. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor Lazar. I think there's an, an interesting point that both of you make. Um, it's both there. We have those innovations, we have those things to celebrate, and we have a systematic problem of change. 
uh, Professor Stein made a similar point and he said we have those, those leaders, we have those super achievers, but we have a middle class that is not following. Most of them are not Domino's Pizza, they are not going into public and, uh, and fighting this in public. Most of them simply don't do anything. No? So what would both of you, uh, uh, Professor Stein and Professor Lazar, be your approach? Our approach at the Zero Project is obvious. We're finding innovative practice and we're showcasing them, we're telling the stories and want others to connect and follow their lead. There might be other ways like enforcing them, changing the laws and enforcing laws. There might be whatever, uh, other giving the money to the government should, should put more money in this. There, and I think both of you know all the ways that exist, but what would be your approach? What would be, what be your advice? How to create those system change? How to make the middle, the middle class change? My, uh, Professor Lasami, uh, you're, you're here on the screen. Maybe you were first to answer this. Uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, and I hear an echo now too. So um, I think that it's really important that the broad scale of users with disabilities, and not only within a certain country, but uh, as Michael mentioned earlier about in developing countries, uh, as well developing areas, that they be acknowledged and included. And I think there's so much that needs to be done related to just understanding diversity involved. Um, you know, Michael and I were working on a, a book that'll be published later this year. A few of the people who are um, authors of chapters uh, are actually a part of the conference today. And it's a book about accessible technology in developing countries. And it's coming out Oxford University Press uh, later this year. And we always make the argument that there's so much innovation happening in developing areas, right? And so you see sort of this parallel where people say, oh, we're going to take developing, uh, developed world technologies and port them elsewhere. Why not look at the innovation in developing areas when there's low, a low amount of resources, yet the innovation they're able to create is staggering and really useful. Right? And so I think what we need to do is look to people with disabilities as the innovators. Right? We need to focus on how do we communicate that people with disabilities are innovators. And yes. Certainly we, um, certainly we have to use all the approaches involved, right? We have to use laws and policies. And um, I also have public pressure on businesses. I believe that that's certainly, you know, boycotts and public pressures. We need to get it out there more. Mm -hmm. Think about it. For most of us at this conference, we're familiar with the core issues. When do you watch a news program and top breaking news story, web accessibility, right? It, it, it doesn't hit the news. It doesn't break out of our community. Mm -hmm. We're in a community of people who understand what we're talking about, and yet these are not topics that generally get a lot of public attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, things thank you. like okay. web accessibility, things about uh, you know mobile phone accessibility, and so we have to think of some different strategies. To educate the world, right? Okay. Because you know if you want to talk about different types of, different types of um, uh, communities. We have maybe some communities where what we need to do is just get the word out. And once people understand, they'll take actions. We have other communities where, you know, like the Domino's Pizza example, where they understand and they're gonna fight against it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to think about what are our strategies for communicating about this. Okay, um, thank, thank you, Professor Lazar. Um, I would also like now to uh, make Professor Stein come in here. Um, uh, Professor Stein, what, would you, what, what is your approach to create this systematic change to, to reach the middle class and make them change their, their ways? Well, I agree with Jonathan that there is room to do many, many things. We ought to do everything. Um, and I absolutely praise the Zero Project on publicizing best practices and things that are working it's in all kinds of formats, low, middle income, and high income countries. In fact, when I teach law and policy, which I am doing this semester, this today, actually, um, I often point them to the Zero Project and say, here's where you could find good things. But after 30 years of watching the sector and watching the needle on employment not moving very much, I've come to the semi-cynical idea that we need very strong enforcement. The Business and Human Rights Treaty, should it be passed and should it include Disability is actually a mechanism whereby multinational corporations, the people who do something like 80% of business around the world, are going to have to include disability or be accountable to it. We have not had that enforcement. We don't have it in the US under the Americans with Disabilities Act and our employment levels have been a disaster. 
In contrast, we see countries like Brazil, which have actually strongly enforced their 5% employment quota, um, and other countries that have done so likewise, be able to push the needle on numbers. And again, numbers can overrepresent or underrepresent, but they're fairly consistent over time. When we have strong enforcement combined with good things like policies, corporate social responsibility, and other measures, we do see progress. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor Stein. Uh, we got some two more minutes. Uh, I think it's it's uh, it's uh, um, I have to raise this, although the time is limited. But when we talk about uh, large employers, we always talk about private sector companies. We talk about those multinationals. We don't talk about the public sector as employer. The public sector could be also be in the lead, uh, and the public sector has different means and instruments uh, that the private sector does not have. They have the public procurement. If public procurement changes, a lot of things would change. Uh, could you both uh, finish our conversation with uh, just a few thoughts of bringing in or encouraging the public sector as an employer or as a change maker? Would that work or would that, wouldn't it be as important as working with the private sector? Uh, Professor Stein, may, maybe you make a start here. It's not either or, it's both. And when we see public sectors committing to employing people with disabilities, we see success. Whether it's the US government under the Rehab Act whether it is uh, Israel's government committing to 5%, whether it is other governments committing, it sets an example and it, and it makes a measure and it sets positive examples. That's absolutely right. And the procurement contract, which you mentioned, Michael, is essentially welcome. That means that every government sends out contracts for things ranging from cleaning services to catering services to transportation. If it can point out disability or any other sector, it wants to improve, it automatically increases employment, it increases visibility, and it sets a very high standard for a good practice. Thank you, Professor Stein. Professor Lazar, you have uh, the, the finishing words now. Absolutely. Uh, so related to procurement, I actually had completed a study recently. I had been doing a series of interviews with um, digital accessibility leaders in um, the state governments as well as state universities. And one of the scary things, I started all the interviews before the pandemic, and so it kind of gave me a front row seat uh, at understanding how technology accessibility management changed during the pandemic. And for these state universities and state government, what was scary is that during the pandemic, um, a lot of these organizations used, uh, I'll call it emergency procurement authority. Right? or they called it um, kind of fast-track procurement authority to bypass all the accessibility requirements. Uh, one of the people that I interviewed expressed their fear that uh, we're going to be dealing with the barriers created by inaccessible technologies that were procured on this emergency procurement track uh, for many years to come. So I think there's absolutely a role for the public sector uh, in terms of procurement. Um, but I was very disappointed to see that, that kind of once... Once things went southward with the pandemic, all these organizations, every single one, every one that I interviewed, every organization, um, they used fast track uh, emergency procurement authority and bypassed all the accessibility controls and acquired a whole bunch of inaccessible technology. So I think that the public sector does have a role to play, but we have to monitor it very carefully because the moment that the facts on the ground change, uh, they, they threw people with disabilities overboard and said, we just need to procure this technology. To, to quote one, uh, one person I interviewed, they said that when they uh, were talking with someone about the problems with their technology procurement, the person indicated that, oh yeah, we don't listen to any, we don't listen to the accessibility, we, don't, we bypass the security, we're just ignoring everyone to procure what we want. Professor Lazar, thank you so much. I'm, I'm afraid I have to come in now and, and, and uh, very un, unpolitely have to, to interrupt this discussion. The, the clock is closing in on, on full hour and unfortunately you have to, to close this so interesting session. I hope we can continue this conversation. Hopefully both of you in the, in the next Zero Project Conference. It's really exciting to, to have both of you.